Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this episode of the Montpelier Happy Hour here on WVEW 107.7 LP Brattleboro, your community radio station. I'm your host, Olga Peters, and this is the show where we talk about how everything in Montpelier shakes out for the rest of us. Hey, Emily Kornheiser, regular contributor, Cindy from Brattleboro. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Olga. I think we're having some of the connection problems we had last time. So I um, did not advance plan for that. And I'm going to fix it right now, but it's so good to be here with you. It's good to be here with you too. And and we should give um, listeners on the radio and the podcast just the heads up. Emily's in Montpelier and we're still, like she said, working on some connectivity issues there. But I don't know about you, Emily, but down here in Southern Vermont, we're having um, some pretty nasty weather. And I think it might be um, playing with with my internet as well. So today might be interesting. It is a wintry (laughs) wonderland, I think, all over the whole state. It's fun that we get to share weather for once. For once, yes. That's one thing I think a lot of folks um, who are my friends who are from outside New England, outside Vermont, they, they don't understand how much the weather can be different, just like two towns over mm-hmm. between say Brattleboro and Whitingham. You know, it's it's what, a 30 minute drive and you can have completely different weather. Um, makes, makes little Vermont unique, doesn't it? Yes. Um, so today we wanted to talk about the um, child tax credit, the big broad landscape out for folks. Um, As I understand it, over the summer, this is according to to Senator uh, Leahy's office, um, the federal government expanded under the American Rescue Plan Act, um, and income eligible households were going to receive, or they did receive, um, a monthly amount per child between the ages of zero and, or infancy and 17. Um, and it was estimated that in Vermont, this extra would support uh, approximately 123,000 children. Um, and, and there has been some reports in the news about how this tax credit helped a number of families who are dealing with poverty um, lessen that, that burden just a little bit. Now, as I understand it, right now, uh, the legislature is looking at something similar. Um, House Ways and Means Chair Janet Ansel has proposed um, a similar program. And it would be at least this is proposed. So who knows? It could change by the time uh, everything is said and done. But right now, I think it's it's a $1,200 credit per child, six years old and younger. And um, it would probably help about 51,000 children in the state. And this is under the bill being considered as H510. Um, So that's kind of like the really broad what's happening now. But I'd love to hear from you, Emily, why is a program like this, um, like why is the the legislature even considering it? What good or or not good, either way, could it, it do for families? Yeah. Um, and so we voted this bill out of our committee. I'm the vice chair of Ways and Means. Um, voted the bill out of our committee two days ago. Um, we sent it to the clerk's office yesterday, and it's going to be on the House floor on Tuesday. And I'm feeling oh, wow. very, very excited about it. Um, I'm reporting the bill, and so I'm still like gathering my final thoughts about it. I've been doing lots of research about the impacts. And so what we know about the child tax credit, the federal child tax credit, is it cut child poverty in the US in a way that we have not seen since um, Johnson era. I mean, really just like a revolutionary change in people's lives. And that's not just sort of extreme poverty because the child tax credit goes to families making up to 200,000 single filers making up to $200,000 a year. It creates space in so many families' lives. 
Mm -hmm. um, and we've talked a lot before on the show about sort of what, um, about the benefits trough, I think we've done that a few times, um, and about all of sort of the extra white noise. And before we went on the air, we've been talking about like the white noise of the brain <laughs> and how COVID's bringing extra white noise to the brain. Um, how much families with young children are dealing with in terms of that white noise, um, how much financial pressures sort of like takes away some of our ability to show up, um, to connect with community, to connect with each other, to care for our children. And so this child tax credit, um, which at the federal level was set up as a monthly payment for six months. And then the mm -hmm. other six months of the year was sort of um, trued up at the end. It creates space for families and it's a way of the government saying in like this very value driven official, non-talking point, non-rhetorical way, we care about families with young children. Um, mm -hmm. What's been really interesting is because of the child, before the child tax credit passed, there had been a lot of conversations in sort of the academic side of um, social support programs. So um, folks who administer TANF programs, folks who advise TANF programs, things like that. There have been a lot of, and then um, when what's his name ran for president, there was a conversation about universal, Andrew Yang, there was conversations about universal basic income. He really sort of mm -hmm. elevated that question. And in all of those questions mixing together is sort of this fundamental research question of what actually happens in people's lives when they just have a little bit more money mm -hmm. that they don't need to hustle so hard for. Mm -hmm. um, what does it mean when a parent has two jobs instead of three jobs? Right. What does it mean when a parent can um, buy diapers at the store five blocks away instead of 50 blocks away? What, like, what does it mean when people can pay their childcare copay um, without doing, going without for food? What, it, like, what does it mean to just create that space in families' lives? And what does it mean for their life? And so even before the federal child tax credit, there are a bunch of academic studies underway internationally, nationally, about what happens in children's lives when we do that. Mm -hmm. And they're starting to see returns. And the child tax credit allowed some of those research projects to both gain a lot more attention than they would have otherwise, but also to be sort of writ larger. And so there's this really cool article in the New York Times um, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, I can send it to you, put in the show notes about mm -hmm. how in, for young, like infants, you know, birth to a year, maybe you see a difference in their actual brain activity when they have these monthly payments going to their family. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not because like money makes people smarter, right? Like it's not, <laughs> there's lots of ways we can talk about it. But what we do know is that, um, opportunities to connect is sort of like how children's synapses develop. And we've talked about yeah. that in the context of childcare a lot. Um, but what's really interesting about sort of like how attachment and parental attention helps build brain connections is just sort of this, and I'm sorry, I'm getting like deep in the weeds of previous um, experience, acad you know, academic and um, work experiences I've had. But what we know about like when kids have sort of this call and response opportunities mm -hmm. with parents mm -hmm. um, or caregivers of any kind, their brain synapses develop faster and they you know, develop different skills. And when you're totally stressed out, mm -hmm. when I am totally stressed out, I am lost in my own head. Mm -hmm. And my ability to be attentive to other people's um, attempts to sort of break through is a lot, lot lower. So it's not even just that like parents can go back to school because they have a little extra money so they don't need a third job and like, you know, maybe become a nurse or something. It's not just that um, there's more like nutritious food in the household. It's also the really profound difference in family stress that happens with a little more cash going to the household and what that means for parents' ability to show up for each other if it's a two parent household for other caregivers to be attentive to them or for the children and like what that means for children's development. 
So that is why, like, I am so excited about this child tax <laughs> credit because, like, writ lo- like, it's like amazing. Like, there's so much science behind it. There's um, so much like value driven budgeting behind it. And I think we've talked so much about like, what does it mean to build a state that cares about families? And for mm-hmm. me, like, this is sort of finalizing that in our tax code. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> It, you know what I find really interesting about conversations like this around um, potential programs like like this tax credit is um, to me they really get at the heart of how do we care for each other and how do we you know have a vibrant economy and because I'm always fascinated with when I hear conversations around funding human services in general, just like broad Mm -hmm. conversations, there's always this, at some point in the conversation, something will come up like, well, it's just so expensive. We just need to save money. Like Mm -hmm. human services are, and and caring for people is just too expensive. And what I find interesting is um, sometimes I wonder, is it too expensive, quote unquote, or is it we're not really putting our money in the best places? Yes. You know, for example, this tax credit, which as I understand how it will operate, will sort of be somewhat automatic mm-hmm. in, the, in the sense of um, fi- it's part of filing your taxes, as I understand it. You know, that to me seems like a lot less infrastructure and effort than say someone needing to go and fill out the the form for food stamps Mm -hmm. uh, or in Vermont we call it um, three squares you know so to me like that seems like that would be less expensive in the long run than say a much more complicated program not not to diss three squares I'm just thinking the paperwork can be a little gruesome for folks Um, and and so to me it's it's just an interesting look at how are we setting up systems that either do or do not support um, some of our goals, Mm -hmm. like caring for families? Yeah, and so as an anti-poverty tool, it's really, really powerful. We spend so much money, so many resources treating the symptoms of poverty. You know, our um, our school budgets, which communities will be voting on fairly soon, um, have been growing year over year in large part because so much of the human services responsibility is falling on schools at this point. Mm -hmm. And um, when we sort of invest upstream, meaning like we try to cut poverty rather than trying to treat poverty, we can make a big impact. And then again, this particular age is a really interesting one. So this birth to six age is really powerful for the brain science. It's also mm-hmm. really powerful for families because that is the years in a family's life where the parents are um, generally have the lowest income level that they'll have in their lifetimes. Mm-hmm. Um, so when we, you know, we're sort of modeling out this tax credit and we looked at what happens if we sort of increase the threshold over two hundred thousand dollars, there weren't even that many families in that, like in those other places because. People are at the beginning of their career, so they're earning less. People have often taken a bit of time off um, in order to give birth, in order to bond, in order to care for newborns. Um, so they are sort of taking a step back in their careers from that and are you know, um, financially challenged from that. Folks often can work a lot less hours because of caretaking responsibilities and bonding responsibilities. Um, so it's not even just the cost of having a child at that age, it's really the earning um, power is much, much lower at that age. And you also often have, um, it's a time where a lot of people are single parenting as well. And so it's really, um, when we look at charts of sort of where our um, tax burdens lie and where people's income potential lies, when we sort of layer this tax credit on top of it, it's a really powerful opportunity to smooth the curve of our tax code for folks who are um, moderate earners. So it's Mm -hmm. not just about sort of, it's not a program that supports children. It's 
a piece of tax policy that allows us to meet families where they're at and really sort of smooth part of our tax code at a time where people most need it from us. And then we have all these awesome like brain science and bonding and family togetherness and like the state standing in for people all layered on top of it. It's really exciting. It's really exciting. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, I can talk more about the mechanics of it in a minute, but unfortunately, because of, you know, Vermont's demographic issues, the cost of this tax credit is not really likely to grow very much year over year, um, which is quite unusual in the tax code. Mm -hmm. So in, in what I've read um, on this uh, H510 bill, um, that it, it could have um, a price tag of just under 60 million. What are you hearing from folks about that? Because sometimes, you know, we like to, we, we see big numbers like that and we go, all go, Ooh! Yeah, so the bill's been through a few iterations on its journey. Um, and it's actually, the cost estimate is a little under 48 million. Okay. Um, as we voted it out. Um, and that actually includes a social security, an expansion of our social security exemptions, um, which we can talk about if we want or not. Um, it's, that's also an important piece of the bill. And so um, I think it's, it's a complicated question um, mm -hmm. because I think there was some broad agreement going into this legislative session that we had a level of revenues coming into the state right now that um, not just because of direct payments from the feds, you know, like we've talked about ARPA, but like outside of the ARPA context, our regular flows of revenues are, I think, 25% higher, which is, is that like, a lot from like meals and tax revenue and rooms and meals oh, from yeah. income tax returns coming in, like from every source other than the transportation fund, like hmm. things are growing. Um, and so I think there was some sense that um, likely part of what we're going to be looking at is a reduction in taxes for Vermonters. And so there are a lot of different ways we could do that. And I've been having sort of the theme over, you know, last year's theme was like the cracks have widened and we've all seen them now, right? Mm -hmm. I got really mm -hmm. tired of hearing about that one and us talking about that one. And this year is go big or go home. <laughs> I love it. Yes. We need t-shirts. We do, except like, where would I wear a t-shirt? <laughs> uh, Put it under a suit coat, it'll look very nice. <laughs> yeah, it'll look so nice in a suit coat. Um, so, and with Go Big or Go Home, you know, we can tinker with the tax code in various places um, and, you know, do a little bit of tweak each place so that like maybe every single Vermonter sees a benefit directly, but it would have to be quite small. Um, or we can say, what can we do that will like really transform our tax code in the direction we want it to be transformed in and will be like big enough to be an actual felt experience for Vermonters, um, mm -hmm. the way the child tax, I mean, the child tax credit on the federal level, like that changed my month to month budgeting. Like it was, it was magical. It was magical to see it and be like, thank you, federal government. And <laughs> that it, it it was just like every time I got this like little ping of thrill um, and it changed my budget. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think like this opportunity for transformative impact is where we need to go when we're doing these things. I think um, there's a lot of other money that we are trying to spend on transformative projects and I still hold out a lot of hope for that. Um, both mm -hmm. the ARPA one-time money and then um, some of the ongoing budget that we have coming in. But there's, I think, still going to be a conversation at the end of the session about like, were we right? Should we be reducing taxes this much? Or do we need to make sure that we're like buffering revenue more into the future? Um, and so that's all going to play itself out. And so what this bill represents is if we're going to reduce taxes at this scale, this is the very best way we think we can do it. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And how do I don't know if you can answer this, but I think over it's either over the summer or 
spring, we spoke with one of the, the members who were going through the, of the panel who were going through our tax code and making recommendations. Mm -hmm. Um, and one of the things she was, and I'm so sorry. Her she's name's Deb wonderful... Brighton. And it was, the, thank you. It was I, a tax structure commission. Yes, Deb Brighton. I'm so sorry, Deb. I completely blanked on your I name. I don't think she's watching us. It's okay. Okay, good. I want to. Well, in case one of her friends is watching us, you know, and you know, it's small, small state. It could it get is around. A small state, and I, I talk to Deb almost every day right now. So <laughs> I, so I, I'm just curious, you know, in, her review process, she was kind of looking at some of these questions too about how can we use the tax code to actually help people um, and, and keep more people out of that benefits trough too. Mm -hmm. um, how does this fit with, with those efforts or are they completely different things? Um, so when the Tax Structure Commission did their work, they, um, that was pre-pandemic. And then like- Oh my gosh, sort of is like, it that long ago? And then um, they sort of finished their work they started like before the pandemic and then did much of their work during early pandemic okay. and finished their work. Um, and pandemic so, time. I know, it's, it'll, it'll be two years in like two weeks. So like for some areas of the country, it's been two years now. Mm -hmm. um, so, lost my thought. I don't How know does if it fit in? these on Fridays, Olga. Um, they, <laughs> What they were, um, they were very focused and some of their recommendations we're working on right now and I can talk about that, but they were very, very focused on um, sort of immediate shifts in tax policy. So like mm -hmm. um, if there was a reduction somewhere that it would be accompanied by an increase somewhere else. Because of sort of where we are with revenues right now, I think there's a lot of energy around reducing right now um, in places where reduction is needed. And then in a couple years when um, we might see the opportunity or the need more explicitly for revenues to increase, we would then seek revenues from places and spaces and people where there was capacity for that. Um, mm -hmm. So the tax structure commission had sort of like a, you should reduce here and raise here and we're reducing here and sort of assuming that we will need to raise over there at some point when the economy finds its way through whatever is happening right now. Um, and then there was also, but they did not, um, most of their focus, they spent a lot of time on, um, they spent some time on corporate taxes, they spent some time on school taxes. Um, the sort of personal burden um, with regard to the income tax was not fleshed out as much in the Tax Structure Commission report. Mm -hmm. In my mm -hmm. memory, though, I have not read it in a year. So I should maybe look at it again. <laughs> There's so many reports that I should look at every month because they're good. Yeah, yeah, there's good juicy information in there. We, and we don't want them just sitting on the shelf getting dust. Yeah. So um, doing my five minute uh, what? before the underwriters check. I know, right? Okay. Um, what do we just want to kind of tie up in a little bow for listeners at this stage before we, you know, we go into our second half? Yeah, in the second half, I'd love to get like deeper into sort of what the impacts look like at different income thresholds. But for now, I just want to be sort of clear. So the plan mm -hmm. for the Vermont Child Tax Credit is $200. Sorry, it's $100 a month. Um, it's $1,200 per eligible child per year. So if you have three kids, you get 3,600. Um, yeah, do the math in your head. On. <laughs> um, so $1,200 per year per child. So that's $100 a month. Um, the long-term plan is that it's paid out in monthly installments for six months and then um, trued up the same way the federal is set up. The first two years, we're not doing that. The first year, it's just gonna be one lump sum at, pay at true up time. And then mm -hmm. the second year, it's going to be a single payment in September, and then a second true up in April at filing time. Okay. With because we're asking the we have two issues. We're asking the administration to spend a year making a clear plan for sort of administering the monthly payments because it's something they haven't done before. Mm -hmm. But we don't want to wait to start the benefit. And then the second thing 
is that there's some question about whether or not food stamp recipients um, might have a monthly payment counted as income. Mm -hmm. And with lump sum payments, like we're setting up with those two payments, they won't be. And so while we figure that out with the feds, um, we'd figure we'd rather be safe than sorry. Mm -hmm. And so it's gonna be a lump sum payment the first year so that people can opt in and say like, yes, I have a child. I need my child tax credit. And then the second year, it would be sort of the one payment and then at um, tax time, so two payments. And then um, we'll figure out how to do the monthly payments the way the feds do from there. Okay. And when folks, you say opt in, they're doing that through their, their tax filings. Yeah. Just like, you know, any other tax credit earned an income tax credit that you um, opt into at tax filing time. And like the earned income tax credit, this is refundable. And so that means that if you have no tax liability or a low tax liability, you get the money back. You get more money than you paid into the system. Okay. Fundable tax. Very exciting. Are the best. So wonderful. Thank you so much, Emily. Hey, listeners, uh, stay tuned. We are going to hear from some underwriters here on WVEW 107.7 LP Brattleboro, your community radio station. And we'll be back for the second half. Welcome back to the second half of the Montpelier Happy Hour here on WVW 107.7 LP Brattleboro, your community radio station. If you're just joining us, I am your host, Olga Peters, and I'm speaking with regular contributor and representative Emily Kornheiser. We're talking about the child tax credit and Bill H510, which will be coming to the floor of the House on Tuesday, I believe Emily said. Mm -hmm. um, I want to thank all the different platforms that um, where we, we show the happy hour, including BCTV. Thank you so much there. Thank you, uh, WVEW. And Emily, what do we need to remind folks of? Well, Olga, the views and opinions expressed here on the Montpelier Happy Hour are those of the host and their guests separately from each other. They are not the views or opinions of the radio station, nor the TV stations, nor the computers that they might be streamed from, nor the platforms that may broadcast them, nor the employers, nor the parties of said hosts and guests, just the people with their mouths talking. Why, thank you. That was a new one, I liked that. That one. was a new yeah, one. That was, I, I, I was impressed with the, the level of detail in that yeah. one. <laughs> So Emily, walk us through the mechanics of um, the proposed uh, child tax credit. Yeah, so um, flat $1,200 for every child in every household between birth and six. So that's the whole year that a child is six. Mm -hmm. um, and then that is for every child. So if you have a few children in your household in that age range, you get $1,200 for each one. It's a refundable child tax credit, meaning if you have a low or a negative tax liability, you get um, money. It's not just taken off your taxes. Um, what else should people know? The threshold that a family would be eligible is both single and married filers. Basically, however you file, whatever your filing status is, head of household, single, married filing jointly, married filing separately, whatever it is, it's $200,000. Um, because we're really sort of thinking about like the people that are caregiving. Only one mm -hmm. person, only one of the caregivers of a child can declare it. Mm -hmm. um, so that's an important piece. And so um, it will cost the total bill um, will reduce state revenues by about $48 million in FY23. Mm -hmm. um, and basically staying at about the same into the future. The credit is forecast to be paid out um, to approximately 34,000 tax returns in Vermont. And that's roughly 40,000 children. Okay. And it's sort of interesting to hear where um, the taxpayers are, like what income level they are. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm gonna read that, even though it's mm -hmm. like sort of hard to hear a chart out loud, but I'm gonna do it yeah. anyway, if that's okay with you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so for folks who are in a tax group that's sort of like negative to $25,000 a year, that's 6,000 um, taxpayers. 
I'm rounding from mm -hmm. 25 to 50,000. That's eight and a half thousand, 50,000 to 75,000. That's about 6,000. 75,000 to 100,000, that's about 5,000. And then 100 to 200, that's about 9,000. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's sort of interesting how distributed, like how evenly distributed it is sort of across those different tax brackets and how many families we see sort of in that, um, in each of them, I guess, it mm -hmm. sort of blows me away. Um, and the Joint Fiscal Office expects that the tax credit will significantly reduce tax liabilities and effective tax rates for lower and middle income groups on average in Vermont. Um, the average tax paid by income group um, is, I don't actually understand that sentence that I'm trying to read, so I'm not gonna read it. It's a little confusing. I'm gonna figure that okay. out before I have to talk about this again. Um, this is a good trial run, right? <laughs> yeah, it is. Thank you very much. Um, oh, for families with a, um, an AGI of less than $60,000. And what's AGI? Um, it's gross income. Thank you. So it's um, like what your federal, I can explain this, it's actually sort of bizarre and wonderful, but okay. essentially you calculate your federal taxes and like not everything at the federal level is considered income, even though it's mm -hmm. dollars that came into your house. Mm -hmm. And what is considered sort of your federally calculated AGI is what Vermont then uses as its base to calculate tax liability for us mm -hmm. for the most part. Mm -hmm. um, and which is an important piece of the social security conversation too that I'm not gonna get into the detail on because it's way in the weeds. But what it means is that for families with an AGI of less than $60,000, most of the families there, um, the tax credit will bring their, li their tax liability um, to zero or below. Wow. Yeah. Interesting. Wow. Yeah. So that's that really exciting to me. Mm -hmm. Mm hmm Yeah. That it's, what I find interesting is um, when you think if, if you're just taking a household with one child, mm -hmm. which is the, what, $1,200? Yep. Credit. 1200 bucks is not huge. No. But yet reducing tax liability actually can have a bigger impact. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it feels a little bit like, um, I'm forgetting the word, but the, like a, the cumulative benefit seems, seems greater. Yeah. And for, me. you know, a lot of families, um, I think, who are sort of at that time in their life, they're really living paycheck to paycheck, sort of regardless of where in that range of income they are. And mm -hmm. so hitting a tax liability at tax time can be really, really challenging. Mm -hmm. um, and then also just sort of having that extra space while you're going month to month. And mm -hmm. so it also means that, like I said, it's um, sometimes on the show, I wish that we could figure out a wonderful radio way to describe graphs. Maybe that's yeah. a project for next summer. Like, graphing with words. Um, but like I said, when you sort of layer this on top of Vermont's other progressive tax policies, it really, we're seeing ourselves smooth a curve that's been needing smoothing for a while. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, what else, um, what are you hearing from folks in the state house? about this bill? Are you hearing a lot of folks just being very excited? Are you hearing concerns? What's the kind of range there? Um, a lot of people are really, really excited. You know, I think um, this was a really powerful part of the Democrats agenda at the federal level. Mm -hmm. And so it's really as um, the federal child tax credit wasn't be able, able to be renewed because of sort of um, the debacle that is Washington right now, there's been a lot of attention in the national media on sort of what the impact was and what it means to take that impact away. Mm -hmm. And we are sort of, we're the first state to do something at this scale um, mm -hmm. since the federal child tax credit went away. There's a couple other states that have child tax credits, but they're um, much smaller and um, impact a much, um, it's a lower amount and it impacts a much narrower population. And so when I talk to, um, 
a lot of folks in the state house and when I talk to advocates in the state house who are focused on issues of children and families, um, on good tax policy, on food access, um, their connections to their national networks are like very, very sparkly right now because of this. And so that's really been fun and interesting to be a part of. Um, and then the other sort of flip side of the state house of this is a lot of Republicans are uncomfortable with it. Um, mm. And so because it's not the tax cuts that the governor put forward in his proposal, um, but what people keep on saying is like, it's too big, like it's too big a tax cut, which is such like a fun flip of the usual political paradigm and political stories. And so I'm like, that's sort of really interesting. Um, that's a good point. As they play it out. Yeah. Um, the one of the Republicans, Republicans on my committee, Scott Beck was one of the co-sponsors of the bill along with me and Janet and a few other people. Um, mm -hmm. Chair of House Education Committee, the chair of the House Human Services Committee. And so, um, you know, it's not, there are a few Republicans that are absolutely on board with how powerful this is. Um, but that's mm -hmm. a funny flip of the paradigm. And then of course there are folks who um, are concerned with good reason about like, maybe we need, like maybe we need these revenues for something else um, because we do, mm -hmm. but it's not clear that we're going to spend them on those other places, even if they're right. there. And so for me, this is my opportunity to make sure that this segment of our communities that desperately needs something and needs mm -hmm. to be seen um, mm -hmm. has that opportunity with the tools that are in front of me with tax policy. Thank you. You mentioned in the first half of the show that um, there's also an aspect of H510 that looks at social security. Yeah. Um, can you give us a, a heads up on, oh, okay, like, how did you just match your scarf so perfectly with your dress, like? It's actually that. just the scarf that I wear every day that matches my coat, and it um, <laughs> was sitting on my desk in a pile of random fabrics, and I felt cold, so I just put it on. <laughs> it is a pure, purely a coincidence, though I think I did pick it as a scarf color because it matches the majority of my clothing. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Okay, so back to back uh -huh. to Social Security. <laughs> um, give us the the lowdown on on what those impacts are. All right, I think I startled you there with my my. It, oh, there I I've never. I I think what startled me is one. It so perfectly matches, which is a level of um, having one's act together that I have never been able to achieve, but. Um, <laughs> And I use the word act instead of other words. Um, but I, I've also never seen you so monochromatic, which just your earrings and your scarf and your your dress are all the same color. And that just really amazes me. I think it's actually partly the video quality. In the mirror, they okay. don't, um, they're not actually this close in color. They're all like okay. shades of blue, but they're all quite different shades of blue. Okay, we'll, yeah. we'll blame it on my computer screen then. It might be, no, it looks like that on my computer screen too, so. Um, Similarly, actually, the chart I'm looking at to explain this to you is um, has bars that are two different shades of blue, which are similar to the shades of blue here, but they are so different that I can differentiate which, which piece of I'm looking at. Well done. Yes, anyway, so <laughs> social security, um, social security income. So for starters, some people that get social security income get social security and um, get social security income and have another form of income. And so people that get social security income don't have another form of income. Mm -hmm. At the federal level, some degree of social security income is exempted from income taxes. And that amount that is exempted from income taxes depends on what your other incomes coming in are, like what your total AGI is. Mm -hmm. Um, the and then word of the day. Yeah. Um, and then it's adjusted gross income. I don't know if I ever actually said what the whole acronym meant, adjusted gross income. Thank you. Uh-huh. Um, and adjusted means like once the exemptions are taken out, that's what adjusts it. So, 
And there's like a fairly, like really bizarrely complicated equation for figuring that out at the federal level that I tried to make an, into an algebraic equation yesterday in order to understand it better. And it was a very funny conversation with our joint fiscal staff who like did not want to make it into an algebraic equation <laughs> for me so I could understand it better. It's like not how his brain works. So, so was this like, if, if a social security payment is going 25 miles on a train track and, and the, <laughs> the tax I exempt like, is going? I was like, Okay, so like the person's income is X, like what are all the things that like act upon it? Like I just sort of wanted to create a process map of sorts and I find mm -hmm. algebraic equations an easy way to make a process map. Anyway, <laughs> now everyone knows that about me. Um, so what Vermont, some other states entirely exempt social security income from their taxation, um, mm -hmm. their state level income taxation. Vermont, rather than doing that, has historically, and still has today, um, even if we don't pass this bill, a social security exemption that's sort of similar to the feds is dependent on what AGI is. Mm -hmm. um, and so what we do um, is we have um, thresholds right now um, with an AGI of $45,000 for single filers where sort of the amount that's exempt um, starts phasing out. And so anyone whose entire income is social security is not paying any income taxes on social security right now in Vermont. Mm -hmm. But people have other income, they have retirement income, they have investment income, sometimes one person in the household is working, the other people aren't working, blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. And social security isn't just folks over 62 or 65, it's also right. social security disability income and survivor's benefits and things like that. Um, which I think is an important part of the mix even though we don't talk about it very often. And so what we're doing um, is essentially just like raising the threshold by $5,000 um, for singles and then $5,000 for married filers. And so mm -hmm. it's not the amount of social security that's exempt, it's at what income level we exempt, if that makes sense. Oh, okay, yep. We, yep. we, we sort of switch the threshold for what your total income is that starts exempt, that exempts your social security. So if your whole bucket is over 55, then the amount of your social security that we would take out to adjust your income um, would be lower. Gotcha. Does that okay. make sense? It's not as clear to me as the child tax credit yeah. process. Yeah. Um, but I see again. where the state's going. Okay. All okay. right. So good practice basically, for Tuesday. The way the tax machine decides if you get a full exemption on your social security income or a partial exemption on your social security income in figuring out what your tax liability is, is determined by how much your total income is, including your social security. Okay. So if your total income is above 55, you'll go through the, only some of your social security will be exempt. And if your total income is below 55, you'll go through the filter that says all of your social security is exempt. It helps pick your, your total income, including your social security. And it's your, to it's your adjusted income from the feds, but we'll just call it total income because it's easier mm -hmm. for the conversation. It decides which door your social security income goes through. Gotcha. That is clear. That Great. is clear to me. Yes. Yay. There's your process map. You had a very nice process map right Thank there. I words. wish everyone on the radio could see like my weird little fishy hands that are swimming <laughs> through the tax filters. All the different um, doors. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so what's interesting about this tax credit and we, there's a lot of places in statute um, where in tax code where we have these thresholds that are static that don't have mm -hmm. um, inflators built in. And this is one of them. And so it's useful every few years to sort of raise the thresholds because what sort of had a policy purpose 10 years ago has a different policy purpose now, right? Mm -hmm. Because in, like inflation, like, you know, small I inflation, not like mm -hmm. the kind of inflation that the newspapers are scaring us about right now. Um, mm -hmm or the Republicans or however we want to talk about it. So um, we're raising that threshold. What's 
interesting about this tax code change compared to the child tax credit code change is that this one is projected to grow significantly year over year, the actual fiscal impacts of it, because we're going to have more and more Vermonters receiving social security income every year for the next many years. Um, mm -hmm. We don't usually project things like this more than five years out, but I think it's pretty safe to say that like 10 years out, it will keep on growing year over year. Um, so this one is a little more conservative in the thresholds that we're putting in place because we know okay. we're gonna see so much growth in it. Mm -hmm. And that's just, that's about demographics and- Yeah, it's just about like the fact that, yeah. you know, Vermont is um, one of the oldest states in the country and is in, um, so I think we've talked before about how like Vermont's, and everyone's probably read this somewhere, like Vermont's sort of always battles with Maine for which is the oldest state in the country. Mm -hmm. um, what's interesting is we are sort of in the top five for folks who get social security the percentage of our population that receives social security income. And it's not the same group of states, which is sort of fascinating. So West mm -hmm. Virginia is in that group of states um, with sort of the highest percentage receiving social security income, which, and they're not, I think, usually in the top five around aging states. Um, mm -hmm. That is fascinating. Well, because I think that we forget about the disability piece yeah. that is thrown into this. Mm -hmm. and yeah, I, disability Vermont, survivors benefits the whole yeah disability <clears throat> survivors benefits and I've um maybe five years ago and have not looked at these charts since then um have seen that Vermont is also usually at one of the top states in terms of percentage of folks receiving disability benefits mm -hmm. and that is all determined at the federal like Vermont government is not very involved mm -hmm. in the process of um approving disability benefits and so right. it's um it's sort of an interesting part of the puzzle because it's much more about sort of us and less about what we do. Mm -hmm. Interesting, thank you, Emily. Yeah. Um, we're starting to, the second half really flew by. Oh um, my goodness, it did. In part, because Olga was talking about scarves. Um, <laughs> I wanna um, quickly let folks know, um, if you are a renter in Vermont, there's been some changes to the renter's rebate form mm -hmm. more than anything. And you probably, I wanna thank the tax department. They mailed me a handy dandy little postcard to, to let me know this information, but I just wanna to touch on it in case folks for whatever reason didn't get that postcard or you know it fell behind the sofa. Yeah, so I was not on the Ways and Means Committee when the renter rebate form changes happened. And so I don't know it quite as intimately as I might know all of this minutia that we just talked about. Um, but I am a person who received the renter rebate for a long time. And so I paid more attention to the conversations than I might have otherwise. So the process is significantly simplified in some very cool ways. The form mm -hmm. is simpler, which is amazing. <laughs> the way household income is figured out is simpler. There used to be this like really terrible thing where if you had roommates, you were pretty much doomed. Um, mm -hmm. There's minutia there that we are not going to get into, but essentially like if you had roommates, you were doomed um, or just like guaranteed to commit fraud, whether you wanted to or not. Right. And <laughs> yes, that's the minutia of doomed. Um, and so that's significantly fixed. And then the other thing that's super cool about the change is it is not dependent on your landlord handing you an effing piece of paper, which in my 20 years of renting, I think was only seamless once. <laughs> mm -hmm. Sometimes it can be like incredibly combative and toxic. Sometimes it's just chasing and waiting. Sometimes like it's just, but it was never good. Mm -hmm. And sometimes not because of anything wrong with anyone else, just like because paperwork is hard. Yeah. yeah. And it's 2022, I think, right? Yeah. And so we don't. So far. <laughs> yeah. And like, we don't need all of those things to be that paper-based. Mm -hmm. Or in fact, we're trying not to touch each other or breathe on each other right now. So that's a really, really exciting change. Another change that was part of it, um, which I think will, will, should, is causing some consternation is that the income thresholds also changed a little bit. Mm, okay. Um, so some folks who historically have gotten the renter rebate might not be getting it anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, which is really challenging. Mm -hmm. 
Well, it's, it's interesting. We've been talking about the child tax credit and social security in this conversation. And I've always appreciated the renter's rebate because as someone who is not married and does not have children, there's a lot that doesn't apply to me. Well, and also if you have a mortgage, you get like all kinds of tax junk because of it too. So mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Um, so thank you. And so folks, uh, if you didn't get the postcard, you can go to the tax department's website mm -hmm. and, and find more information there. And um, we have a office of the taxpayer advocate that oh, folks right. might not know about. And um, he's just one man, but he's a very nice man. And you're welcome to call him if you are having tax confusion or tax advocacy challenges or anything like that. Like he is there for you in government to help. Um, so that's also an option if you're having trouble finding your way through it. And he also like really very much collects advocacy throughout the year and then tells the legislature about it once a year. We just heard a report from him. Um, that's handy. So he's a great person to complain to other than your legislator. And um, where can you find his information? Also on the tax department's website, or you can just Google Vermont taxpayer advocate and he will, he actually works in the tax department, unlike um, say the healthcare advocate who works outside of um, state government. Okay. Great. So he's really fun um, and people can be in touch with him. And then the other thing um, sort of related to the renter's rebate and our earlier conversation, we were talking about the tax structure commission Mm. One of their biggest recommendations, which I think we talked about when Deb came on the show, was moving to an income-based um, education tax system. Yeah, yeah, Rather that's kind than, of faded a little bit, yeah. that conversation. So yeah. some Vermonters pay their education taxes based on the value of the property, and some Vermonters pay their education tax based on their income. Mm -hmm. And there's a proposal that we're working on right now on Ways and Means about moving everyone to an income-based education tax. Um, and there's implications for renters in there that likely will spell new changes in rent, renter taxation um, okay. that we will get into at some other point when we have another opportunity. So um, if you are excited about the renter rebate changes, if you are unexcited about the renter rebate changes, it's a great time to be in touch because it's all always in flux. Wonderful. Thank you, Emily. Yeah. So um, we are out of time just about here on the Montpelier Happy Hour on WVW 107.7 LP Brattleboro. Hey, Emily, um, I want to toast in a moment. But before we do that, if people want more information or they need to reach out to you, how do they do that? Folks can go to emilykornheiser.org where you will find links to all of my social media accounts to my weekly newsletter. You can sign up for my weekly newsletter to get into your very own inbox. Um, it is incredibly detailed um, and has opportunities for skimming. <laughs> and then on my website, you can find my phone number and my email address and an opportunity to sign up for my weekly office hours, which happen on Sundays at four, as well as monthly community conversations, which happen on Wednesday evenings. So many ways to be in touch. Thank you, Emily. And as always, you can find the Montpelier Happy Hour on WBEW, as well as BCTV, uh, our Facebook page, the Montpelier Happy Hour, uh, wherever you find your podcasts, you can subscribe there and the MontpelierHappyHour.Captivate.FM website. So Emily, Olga. I want to toast. Um, so as folks may know, I, I study feng shui. That's, that's my, my geeky little woo-woo part of my life. And we just are entering the year of the water tiger, which as someone who is born in a tiger year, I'm very excited about. But um, I just want to toast to the water tiger year because it's going to be, has the potential for having a lot of um, energy, potentially explosive energy. And I think that's got a lot of people very nervous. But I also want to toast to, it also has the potential to really ask us, how do we want to use our power? And how, when we are confronted with uncomfortable situations, will we lean into them, look in a, in a sense of using our creativity and our wisdom and our joy and inspiration, 
or will we lean into them using fear and anger and rage? Those are kind of some of the choices Tiger is giving us this year. So I just feel that that's really powerful and I want to wish everyone the best. I want to toast to Tiger and I just want to say when we have the choice to the best of our ability, I hope we lean into curiosity and creativity and courage and wisdom and inspiration. Cheers. Cheers. Can I say something before we wrap or should we end it and then I say Oh, we totally, you can totally say something. So I don't do New Year's resolutions because who needs that? But I usually pick like a mindful word of the year to help me sort of think about what energies I want to bring into this mm. next phase. And I was, you know, this was quite a year. And so I was a little late coming up with the 2022 word of the year. And just yesterday, I decided what the words were. And Olga, they're courage and curiosity. What? That's brilliant. I love it. <laughs> so 2022, courage and curiosity. Cheers again. Thank you, Emily.